or any plan to work, we need to secure the plan and all of that. Well, we want to talk about how we can curb these incessant issues of insecurity that we have all over the place, starting from what we just heard from the Minister of Transport, Shea Adita, who joins us this morning, is a former state security operative, and he is still in the business of security. Thanks for joining us this morning. Good morning. Well, so much has been said and is being said about this whole insecurity issue and all of that. And you have heard, you know, the Minister of Transport say we can't restore services until we rescue the people that have been there. But that's not the only reason. There are those who are still raising the issues around the security of that corridor in itself. Otherwise, you know, it's going to be like, uh, it's, it, it, it's going to be a show of shame, so to speak. What's your take on that? Or do you think it's just something for the optics? <laughs> okay. So um, if you look at um, what he said, uh, he spoke about the security surveillance system mm. and that um, the only reason why he cannot guarantee the resumption of the service is because we're still uh, having some people there that even though, even when those equipment are installed. But the truth is that... Um, um, even if we don't have anyone in captivity today and you have um, the surveillance system in place, it still cannot guarantee security uh, of that infrastructure. So we need to understand the fact that what they are installing is supposed to be part of the project ab initio. It is not um, right for you to build such infrastructure without a surveillance system on it. So, the surveillance system itself is not meant to guarantee protection against this type of threat. It is largely um, safety uh, occupies a larger portion of the surveillance system on the rail infrastructure. That is about 70% safety and 30% um, security. Because um, when you are trying to build security around an infrastructure. For it to be well fortified, you need to layer your security. That is from the nucleus and the use extended externally, such that there are going to be certain level of protection that will wade off attack or alert you before the threat gets to the center. Now, if you look at the rail infrastructure, one, it occupies a large expanse of land. Two, is a moving infrastructure. That is, the nucleus of it is the rail line and the coach that carries the people. So what a surveillance system does is that, one, it helps you to be able to identify the people through maybe um, passenger information system. Then you have cameras with different types of sensors that uh, those that will be able to manage, uh, monitor, um, sensitivity on the rails, on the rail line, where certain level of pressure will show that something, uh, one activity is taking place and the camera will focus on it. But if you look at the kind of threats we are looking at, the kind of threats that is, we are faced with is not the kind of threat that this will solve. So essentially you are saying that government did not foresee, the authorities did not foresee this kind of threat? Well, we still have to look at the design of our rail infrastructure from the beginning. Was it incorporated? Was it planned that um, this will be installed in phases? Because if you remember, the uh, immediate past uh, Minister of Information said that they designed the surveillance system and they couldn't get approval. So was it part of the initial design? Was it that money was not released, full money was not released for full implementation? So this I'm, 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 just sorry, I'm a little confused because um, some of these rail lines are not new. They were inherited from the old Nigerian Railway Corporation. Wouldn't that be the case? No, some, know, some were built. Some, built I said uh, some were not new. Some of them are not new. Some of them have been in existence. Perhaps if there was some kind of threat analysis uh, that, okay, this is this could happen based on this kind of uh, insecurity issues or challenges that we've been having since 2009, possibly this kind of thing could happen. Possibly uh, if this 
guys are rooted out uh, they could begin to take on soft targets such as infrastructure and things like that so I, I'm just wondering if you think that this whole idea just as you were saying is this something that government didn't think about because to invest the kind of resources that have been invested including loans into such infrastructure and not protect them even in our thinking it's a serious indictment there, wouldn't you say? See, if, if, if you look at, um, there's what you call threat assessments or risk assessments. And this is you trying to identify the risk and then also look at the possibility of it occurring. And if it do occur, what is the uh, criticality, I mean, uh, its impact on. So if you look at the way in situation Nigeria evolved, this whole thing started from the Northeast. Nobody was really thinking that um, the threat at that time will actually spread and the Northwest become the epicenter of terrorism in Nigeria. That is what it is today. So we're talking about um, a nation that I, insecurity I, you know, is I, evolving. Forgive me. I am <laughs> surprised that you would say that we didn't see it coming and that no one would ever have thought because the Metatsini riots... Wasn't it somewhere around the northwest that it all started in the first place, and back in the 80s? But the threat then, the threat to run that, is, is didn't come in this dimension. Yes. We're, 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 we're talking about threats now, or uh, non-state actors that are now attacking critical infrastructure. Oh, oh, Mr. Adetaya, if I, if I may come in there, you know, recall that well before Mar the March 28th attack by the, the terrorists, you know, the, the kidnappers on the Abuja Kaduna train, that route had, uh, you know, experienced some level of threat from last year when the train in transit was shot at. That's a threat assessment. Yeah. Uh, and also, um, the, the minister had, you know, warned that there may be attacks on, he had given intelligence, you know, on the Abuja Kaduna train. That's a threat assessment. So this lack of planning and preparation, and, and it's been six months, even though you talk about the complexity of installing uh, security equipment and provision of security for the surveillance equipment itself, doesn't it speak to a lack no, of vision it's, 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 it's and lack of planning no. since we have all of these Your, warning trajectories? You didn't get what I, what I, what I was no, trying no, to I, say. No, I did. No, I, what I'm trying to his say question is that was, there's been sufficient was it not part warning? of the plan ab initio. And you know, this real project, it don't start with this government. It started with the previous government. So, and I said, me and you, we've not seen what the master plan looks like. So I said, it could be part of it from the beginning. You know, in Nigeria, we have issues about releasing of money, the way we implement projects. Okay, let's do phase one, phase two. Maybe security was involved, and this component was part of maybe third phase or fourth phase of the implementation, we do not know. But what we know is the fact that sometime last year, the minister spoke about the fact that there is something that they intend to install, but the approval was not given because of uh, certain people queried uh, the, what the cost and then how it was to be implemented. So was it, um, uh, and a, a design that came an afterthought because of the attack on that train, or was it part of it from the beginning? So that's what I was trying to say. I don't, I don't want to say, oh, maybe government did not plan around this. But remember I said from the beginning, this is supposed to be part of it from the beginning. When you are designing such, you see, um, this integrated surveillance system is actually majorly for safety. And I'll tell you why. You see, in every country where you have it, the intention is to ensure that nobody uh, is tampering with the rail to derail the train. Mm -hmm. So most of the things that are around this is to ensure that safety of the, you know, the difference between safety and security. Yes. Safety of the passenger from point A to point B and to prevent collision of train and other. That's the reason why they have that system. The 30% security component is to ensure that you don't bring threat from outside into the train system. Inside the train. Inside the train. Okay. By checking the passenger, getting, having the information of all the passengers, then being able to watch and see what is happening mm -hmm. around it. But you know, in those adverse countries, this kind of threats, they are not readily imminent. 
unlike we have it in Nigeria. So if we are talking about this for Lagos Ibadan rail system, wow, spot on. Okay. But if you are talking about Kaduna Abuja track, it will not solve the current problem but the, the until yeah. other uh, security solutions are incorporated. The, the questions are a myriad, uh, Mr. Adetayo, and I know that we still have a couple of uh, people in Abuja with my, my other colleagues. But when you say that this you know, train, you're talking about safety over security, meanwhile, this road, these rails run through various communities. Is there, one would question whether or not there is some kind of buying of government or of the corporation, the railway corporation, of the people to join in protecting the infrastructure. Because how is it possible that such things, so people will go into those communities and through communities to those rail lines and people didn't it raise any... It beyond NRC. You see, what NRC is supposed to do is what they are talking about now. The S is provide infrastructure, provide surveillance system on infrastructure. It's not the responsibility of the government through its security network, okay. networks, to ensure that there is peace, there is security along the corridor. Which will protect the infrastructure. Which will protect the infrastructure. Okay. You know, it's like uh, this idea that says that, um, you know, a, a bed that perched on the roof, if the roof is not settled, the bed cannot be settled. Okay. So that is issue around that corridor. Let, let, let's settle a number of uh, messages <laughs> right now. Then we'll be right back to take on the rest of it. Stay with us. Prominent Islamic scholar based in Geshua who was traveling along from Kano to Geshua in his Honda Accord car with registration number KBT 31 AE arrived at the military checkpoint at Nguru. Lance Corporal John Gabriel requested the Islamic cleric to offer him a leaf to judge Imaji, which he obliged. While driving before reaching Judge Imaji town, the assailant asked him to park that there was an unusual sound. However, Nemesis caught up with the culprit when a passerby going to his farm early in the morning sighted a corpse, a vehicle, and some people, then alerted the police from Judge Maji, who promptly mobilized a race down to the scene. When he's taking the under of the vehicle, that's when, because even me to I, I drop, that's where I now remove my own rifle and I now remove my magazine and fix. So you know, and I asked him to, what of the back tire? Did you check the back tire or we should just go. He said, let him check the back tire. So as he's trying to cross over to the back tire through the passenger side, that's where I removed my rifle and I pointed at him. He now asked me, what have I done to you? What have I done? I said, you don't do anything. I did you want to kill me? I said, oh, no, I don't want to kill you. He keep quiet. So I now fired warning shot. I, I fired up, thinking that it would scare him so that he would run away. At that spot now, the car is still steaming. It's not off. The car is still steaming. The car is not off yet. So when I fired a warning shot, thinking that the man will run away, but the man do not run away. So at that point, now when he want to go, when the man want to run because of the first shot, when he want to run away and enter a vehicle, I now fired a second shot on his arm. Another perspective to the issue altogether. Let's head for more in Abuja. Oh yeah, thank you. We've got two gentlemen joining us here today. Colonel Yomi Dare is former director, Army Legal Services, alongside uh, Joshua Cabello, who is former deputy inspector general of police. Gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for coming on today. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. Just so many things going on because I mean, we we also understand that yesterday, uh, Lake Chad busying commission countries and their security personnel, they met yesterday to consider the growing challenge of uh, insecurity uh, r around the area. But about some of the, what the issues my colleagues have talked about concerning provision of security across the country, the real services particularly, one wonders, um, I don't know if you get the sense because, I mean, having been there, you might have called one or two of your colleagues. They might have told you that Probably, uh, have we done any sort of assessments for that area to see that since it's a moving target, even if we reopen the services, that attack, chances of it repeating itself will be reduced to the barest minimum. Do you get that same sense? Because if they say 
we need to install a technology-based security solution to allow us, to enable us to resume those services. How does that come across to you? Well, um, just like uh, the gentleman uh, from the Lagos studio did some analysis of uh, this, uh, this infrastructure, uh, the, the, the system, the railway system itself, I, I kind of align with him. Is that the point here is that um, it's not enough at this point in time to just install the, uh, the uh, technology. I mean, these are things that one would expect in this 21st century to have come, you know, with uh, 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 the, the, the equipment or the, 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 the transport itself, okay? And then um, aside that, you see, generally here, we, we tend to be uh, reactive rather than being proactive because we've said the times without number that, look, before even the train system started, there were issues on the Kaduna Abuja Road, and it was really bad. Several times, military men were deployed there. Sorry, sorry force policemen were deployed there. You know, military men were deployed there. It was, you know, undefiled. And then the railway system came into place, and everybody moved, of course, to the rail, rail, rail system. And just like uh, Bukola in Lagos uh, also cited, I mean, at a point in time, uh, you know, the, the trains were, we, we know, were, was fired at. I mean, that's enough warning for us to ensure that, you know, I mean, have to, how, many, how many kilometers of, of, of road is this? <coughs> to ensure that, you know, we do proper uh, uh, deployment. And again, we need to make adequate use of, uh, of uh, intelligence, you know? I mean, there are settlements along these rail lines. And times without number, it, it has been proved that even some of these attacks, of course, it won't be unrelated to those, you know, settlements. So what have we done? Mm. Well, you maybe know? that's where Ms. Habila comes in. Uh, you could tell us, has there been any operational change, modification, if you will, on the part of the police to ensure that they are adapting to our current circumstance security-wise? Um, yes, okay. Um... For the Nigerian police, uh, you could see also that um, virtually um, the security agencies and um, the military and others uh, were taken aback. Um, they were taken by surprise. And um, this incident that happened on the 28th of March, um, if we want to specifically look at what the security agencies have, have done, um, we, we would say that um, I think um, not much of planning has been done. And um, of course, um, that service is, is, is not on yet. But I think that um, the government have a responsibility because the government has the responsibility of um, welfare and security to its citizen. The citizen also must, must, must tinker with the... Yeah. With the but, Mr. Bela, when you say not much has been done, mm. we were taken by surprise, you've been there in the service. Why is this the case? Uh, you, you see, the, the manner in which this um, crime was executed requires that um, the, the, the local communities around that area, because they came on a motorcycle, and so, so long as you do not capture the, the, the communities that live in that area who should be able to uh, put a call through or who should be able to, to, to notice those strange people in that general area and raise an alarm and give that um, information uh, to the police or any security agencies, um, once that is lacking, then um, the planning is not correct. But... Well, in, in, in operations, I mean, pardon me, while this project was being conceived or at any point in time, perhaps while you were in service, do you recall, was there ever any meeting with the police, the hierarchy, concerning this project, talking about the security component of the project? Yes. Oh. Uh, when, when, when this um, service was, 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 was to take off, there was, there was some discussion and... Um, take off or 
being planned. Being planned. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, the, the, the transport ministry had uh, contemplated the idea of training what we call um, train marshal. Hmm. But I think they were waiting for one or two things, and it never took off. Otherwise, I am very sure that um, police officers were trained and returned and posted uh, to assist with security within the coaches in, in, in the train. But then there was, there was this arrangement again that um, such people should be trained specially and deployed and known as um, uh, train, uh, uh, train marshals. What about along the corridor? Around the corridor, um, I, th I think the, 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 the ministry leverage on, 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 on the deployment of the police that have been done um, along Kaduna Road. But I don't think there was specific um, uh, mentioning of, of, of deployment for the purpose of, of, of put, uh, putting an eye on, on the train, uh, uh, rail, on the railway. Mm. Well, let me change now somewhat to the last uh, story we saw before yeah. we when we got back from the break uh, about the murder of this um, of the Sheikh Sheikh Goni. Um, trying to get his surname now, uh, Sheikh Goni Gashwa, who was murdered last Friday I by soldiers. Yes. Um, it was a very, very sad incident because this, this is a question of trust, which was also betrayed. I mean, someone, um, a Nigerian citizen, picking up soldiers at a military checkpoint, not just randomly on the road, at a military checkpoint, and these soldiers in turn turning their gun on this uh, in shake and, and murdering him. Um, in some circles, there have been, um, let's say, religious coloration to the kind the, the, to the murder. Um, it's not clear the motive of this of the soldiers in doing it. It's not clear whether it is for economic benefit or whether it is some uh, bigotry, you know, which you know which they hold in their hearts. It is not clear yet, but there have been some religious interpretations to it, to this. And in recent times, we've been seeing more and more um, of these sort of uh, crimes against um, Nigerian citizens in, in different areas, in different aspects. But oftentimes, if the people involved are of different religions, we see this religious coloration to it as well. How is this affecting the ability of uh, security agencies to be able to tackle crimes effectively and, and, and see them for just what they are, crimes against the Nigerian people and crimes against the Nigerian state? Let me take your own opinion first. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Well, um, yes, I, I heard about this and then I read about it and of course we've just watched it here. I mean, I, I think this is highly condemnable. Uh, even the, the, the president himself said it. You see, uh, as soldiers, uh, we, we, are not, we are not trained to, to indulge in this kind of, uh, of act. It's totally, you know, uh, uh, condemnable. It's, it's against military ethics. Because ordinarily, even as a, as a soldier, when you go to war, the moment, you know, um, uh, an enemy uh, surrenders, you cannot even take the life of the enemy talk less of uh, someone who has just offered to, to give you a ride. So uh, what we are looking at here is it, one must look beyond the issue of a religion here, unfortunately. We will have to look beyond the issue. Of, so it, it, it's, it's likely that these are just, you know, some bunch of criminals because in every society, whether you like it or not, there are fifth columnists. So this is not you know, a, a representative or a representation of what the military stands for, you know. And incidentally, I mean, Unguru, that, that place, that was where I started my military career, you know, some years back, you know. I mean, there's been a very, very, it used to be a very, very peaceful place, you know, from the Unguru, Gashua, even before the, 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 the rail line there, the Northeast uh, rail line, you know. And again, aside that, you find out that once there's a military operation, there's what you call unintended consequence of military operation. People are bound to take advantage of, you know, the exercise and just go wild and just behave in manners that are not part of the doctrine mm. and not part of the training. So in this instance, honestly, this is totally out of it. And for those who are quick to jump at, you know, religious uh, coloration to this. You see, the facts and circumstances are not even the same. Mm. 
They yeah. are not the same at all. So, so we need to look at it, you know, beyond... It, it is remarkable that the police were able to effect the arrest yeah. of the soldiers in this, in, in this instance. And I, I do not know if you want to comment on that. Um, <laughs> it's interesting that we have the police and the army well, here. Well, maybe, 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 before my colleague, maybe before my good friend Habila talks, I, I must commend the effort of the, the police at this. Yeah. And I've always said something. We have some of the best police you know, in the world, if they want to do their job. And in this instance, it was well, you know, demonstrated. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the effort of the police must be commended. And of course, in the military too, you know, I mean, we, 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 we all support each other. We support each other. Mm -hmm. Because so, this guy, first, is subject to, uh, to, to, the, um, to, to, to the military law and the civil law. And once the, he'll be tried, <coughs> you know, once he's tried and he's uh, found guilty, he's uh, dismissed you know, accordingly, and then, you know, given to the police, who will carry on the... That hasn't the happened yet? Well, this thing just, this is a re very recent, uh, yeah, you know, uh, incident. So there's still uh, time. But I can assure you that that is what will, you know, happen. Okay, so I wanted you to comment on, on that. I mean, the increasing, will I say, weaponization of religion in criminal matters, and also uh, the intervention of the police in this particular matter. Yes, okay, it's... um. I do not. I do not think that um, it it will be too. It will be too early for us to assume that um, religion is 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 one of the bases for what, for what has led this uh, officer to do what he did. Um, rather, some in, insanity and um, something that um, cannot be placed. And um, I, I don't think there is any justification at all. And the police tried. By, by by making sure that uh, this 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 soldier is, is disarmed, and um, this 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 soldier is going to face the the, the law. But, but I know that um, this is unheard of, and this is something very strange. And so um, the, the his health condition, in terms of um, uh, if 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 he's insane or, what, or whatever like like that, uh, the, the the public will know but it's, it's an unfortunate situation that would have been avoided. Is it going to be tenable for him in the army if he pleads insanity? Insanity? Well... Or some sort of mental condition? That, again, depends on uh, the medical uh, report. Okay? So because if you plead insanity, there must be a medical report. And of course, uh, definitely, uh, 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 you know, even before he got posted... You see, so this, this, these are some of the, um, uh, uh, you know, lessons that even military commanders must, you know, take note of. Because there, there's this need for probity and accountability in everything, you know. And um, uh, uh, because of this, the, the current uh, situation, you know, insecurity, you find that, that uh, a lot has happened. Even when, when, when uh, our, our, our soldiers, uh, you know, take part in... Um, foreign operations, we, we find cases uh, yeah. uh, like this. Because, I mean, and it's not even, it is not akin to, to our crime alone. Yeah. Even when the U.S., you know, mm -hmm. all, all the activities... Fact, that feeds to the next line of, of question, because you, you've been director of Army Legal Services, yes. so you know the purview mm -hmm. of what can happen. So how does PTSD fit in here? If he says, if perhaps that comes in in his trial or court martial or something? Well, I mean, he's a young soldier. Don't young soldiers suffer PTSD? Well, um, again, it, it, uh, it all depends on um, how long he has been there, mm. you know, uh, which, of course, again, underscores the need for regular, you know, um, uh, uh, regular... Uh, orientation mm. and regular redeployment, you know, so that I you don't allow up. them to stay too long. You know, in the this theater. this is coming up because we we reported several cases yes. where we see they say the policemen or the army officers they just somehow you see it appears as well as freak scenario accident or shooting, yeah. and we haven't actually been so very point blank saying look this is a clear case or sign of PTSD. So it comes across as though we gloss over those kind of things, yes. say, well, in this climb, they're supposed to be strong, yes. they shouldn't succumb to PTSDs. That's why we ask, what kind of considerations do we give or what should they be looking at for to ensure that 
cases of PTSD or symptoms of PTSD are spotted in good time and attended to? Well, uh, uh, like I said earlier, the facts and circumstances are not the same at all. Because this is a clear case of either the guy has an economic motive, he wants to rob this guy. Mm. This guy is in a beautiful car and he sees him, you know, the way a cleric, you know, I mean, we just dress simple and I just looked at him. I, oh, come on. That thing just comes into his head. Let me get rid of him and all these things. But I, again, uh, uh, because it, it's, it's you, even, even you, can, you, you can listen to the soldier himself that he's really remorseful. He's very sober, you know, because it was uncalled for. It was just uncalled for. And then again, I don't think it has anything to do with religion in the circumstance. Okay. Because he has a soldier, mm -hmm. you know, a, 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 a soldier has, has no color, a soldier has no religion, you know, a soldier has no tribe, okay? A soldier is for all. Mm. And that uh, is the, the training. The, the thing is, that's the training, but how are we ensuring that the Nigerian public yeah. are interpreting these things in that manner? Because uh, whether or not we like it, in recent times, the sort of crimes against the state we have witnessed, in, insurrections we have witnessed against the state, have oftentimes taken on a religious coloration. And we've been, you know, we're saying for years, Boko Haram, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not Muslims. Mm. Uh, when things happen on the other side as well, we say, no, that's not a representation of Christianity. But that doesn't stop the Nigerian public from still looking at these crimes in, in this sort of manners and coloring them as such. And I'm, yes. I'm wondering whether there is any effort. Are we doing anything extra to ensure that, you know, crimes are treated for just what they are? Crimes. And, that, and that, is, that is now a clarion call on leadership. A clarion call on leadership. That when we have cases like this, when we have criminal matters, it should be dispensed of expeditiously. Okay? You know, whether it's a Muslim, whether it's a Christian, it should be dealt with appropriately. Because Nigeria, of course, it's, it's, we, it, it, it's, it's, so, it's so cosmopolitan, you know, that we, we just must take care of uh, every side, you know. So in fairness, uh, 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 because you must have seen the trend of things. I was talking to someone yesterday, and we were just discussing. And of course, the person said, look, by the way, uh, 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 I mean, uh, this um, uh, Chibok girl, you know, was, was, was immediately married out, you know. I mean, and a, you know, a Christian for that matter. And then the next thing now, you know, the last incident of the train, uh, uh, you know, the 20th of uh, March train incident, there's also a Christian girl there who, who, the, who is, is reported that the leader of, uh, of, the, of the sect, you know, is trying to marry yeah. her again. Yes. So, I mean, all these things, you know, and of course, again, there's the, the, there's the, there's the um, uh, theory that, oh, I mean, in recent times, most of the, of the people who have been freed by the, uh, uh, the insurgents are just from one religion, you know? So, so there's need for us. But most importantly, I think the government should just do everything to go all out to ensure that, you know, all these captives are released. And immediately too, so that we can have you know peace All and right. we can assuage nerves, you know, of, of uh, the, yeah. the, the the you know religious uh, coloration into In our Abina, governance. Yes. When you hear that, well, it will be insensitive to resume the real services because of those who are in captivity. I mean, naturally, many will want them to be released, but they will equally ask that does that then suggest that um, if they're not released, we don't know however long that takes, that service cannot continue, even if the security agencies can guarantee us that it is safe to resume that service. Well, there's the need for uh, the transport ministry of building um, trust and capacity of um, the system they put on ground to ensure that um, some of these things are put into check. Um, we still have um, quite a number, and um, there are still a lot of um, information coming out to, 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 to say that um, they are even trying to marry one of the, one of the victims of, 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 of this incident, a girl, a Christian girl also, to 
a Muslim right out there, the leader of, of, of that team. And so uh, this thing is still as fresh as it were. But I also think that um, like, like, like it is in, 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 in um, security cycle, um, security, ensuring security of, 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 of properties and, and the people must not uh, be left in the hands of the government. Okay. All right, Mr. Abela, pardon me. We need to jump in there and thank both of you for coming on. Colonel mm -hmm. Yomi Dari, former director, Army Legal Services, as well as uh, Mr. Joseph Kabila, former deputy inspector general of police. Thank you both, and good to see you directly here in Abuja. <laughs> I know you're surprised a little bit. Well, we still have uh, something to wrap up in Lagos, guys. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank Chamberlain. You. Well, um, Mr. Adetoyo, I know you wanted to add a, a word or two <laughs> to some of the things that you heard, especially about yeah. the, the soldier and all of that, but we'd, we have limited time. Make it quick. Okay, um, quick one. See, there is a pattern in terms of um, what we've been seeing of late, of, of recent. We've seen soldiers killing their superiors. We've seen soldiers, you know, shooting civilians, shooting police, police soldiers fighting. Mm -hmm. One recently in Lagos. There is a pattern. We can't just wish it away and say PTSD or, or trauma, some form of trauma is not involved. And um, you don't look at an incident and say, oh, this one. We see... I expect that, let us look at this case very well and critically, uh, because the way psychologists will look at this matter is different from the way a lawyer will look at so it. So you think a psychology, there's a psychology gap? For someone to shoot, it's someone a, that has seen, there, there is a line of killing. Mm -hmm. The moment you cross that line, it's, like it's a problem in Nigeria. We don't give trauma therapy to our law enforcement officers and soldiers. The moment you kill someone, you're already traumatized. It's going to be a phase of trauma you are facing. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of stressors around, the, you know, the process of you going to war, you know, several things. And then... Yeah. It, it, we, we it really have to, I'm sorry, Bukala, we really have to wait. We are, we are completely just, out of time. This time, we're, time is out. <laughs> we, we are out of time. We have to thank you okay. very much, uh, Mr. Shiyaritayo, for being a part of our conversation this morning. He's a former uh, state security operative. Thank you so much much for your time.